Yeah. Let's talk about s- statistics modeling um, and all cause mortality. Oh, yeah. Okay. Our favorite pet subject, right? Yeah. So, the one thing that you were passionate about at the end of our prior conversation was that uh, a lot of people latch on to the correlation is not causation. Yeah. And y- you feel it's. You feel it's a bit over. It's a bit taken too far, right? Go ahead yeah. and expand on that. Yeah, as in, it's it's just repeated, almost like drone like. You know, it's just if if people see it's an well, <clears throat> I got two things to say. One, people see it's an epidemiological study, and they say, well, correlation isn't causation. So let me just not even bother reading this study. But what's comical is that when it comes to other things, blood pressure insulin resistance, you know, any of these other more established markers and risk factors that people just more or less universally agree are problematic. You don't hear that critique, which I just find, I I just want to state, I just find that very comical. Anyway, but yes, correlation is not causation. I still think that's true. Um, but as statistics has, has been developing over the many decades, we've started to get to this point where we can control for different variables and whatnot. Now, to be clear, I'm not stating that I am a, an expert in uh, controlling for these different variables and stuff. Again, I have to rely on researchers and biostatisticians, which I have taken some time to to reach out to biostatisticians, sit down with them, and have them explain to me, you know, how this kind of stuff works in general. Um, but you know, have I done these kinds of like controls and 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 whatnot? No, I haven't. So there's a certain level of trust again in the researchers that do this kind of research that you can control for these different variables, which ultimately solidifies it. I, I wouldn't say that it ever gives you a hundred percent answer. But it, it increases with each controlling variable that you're able to account for. It increases your likelihood that you're aiming at the right direction. And I don't think that a lot of people give that enough credit. And I'm assuming that your perspective, and I'm sure you'll give it again, which is that we can't necessarily rely on the sp- maybe the specificity on of some of these controls is that somewhere in 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 the ballpark you're of course familiar with bradford hill yeah i i'm a bradford hill stan okay (laughs) i love bradford hill i (laughs) think that i think that a lot of folks claim they meet bradford hill's threshold but to be fair and uh this is often a a missed point by many people. Bradford Hill's super uh, towering icon in epidemiology. He had his Bradford Hill criteria, which a lot of people hear about the Bradford Hill criteria. And it's these uh, different assessments. Uh, the three we probably hear about the most are strength, consistency, and temporality. Um, so when something's super strong, it means that the the exposure to the outcome are both super high and highly correlated, right? Uh, the consistency is that it shows up in multiple lines of evidence. That's brought up a lot, for example, with the EAS paper and so forth, right? Now, this is where one of my first objections is going to come in. Bradford Hill, getting back to the strength, would consider, and, and he was most famous for coming after smoking. He, he felt that smoking was bad and gave these assessments to show how his criteria showed that the threshold level of hitting his criteria for smoking, for example, causing lung cancer was very strong, mm. right? He didn't have an endpoint where it's like, ding, 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 you got it. You, yeah, you've confirmed sure. it. Sure. He acknowledged that observational data did have that limitation. Yeah. But that said, uh, even in his initial speech where he uh, out, you know, outlined these criteria, I'm not sure, but I think this was in his initial speech, he brought up when it came to either cardiovascular disease or all-cause mortality, smoking was still just barely a two on like the hazard ratio, and he didn't consider that very strong, okay. he said in his speech. And I think a lot of people since then, myself included, would be like, okay, I kind of don't even want to look at something. 
until it hits a two, right? So that you can actually see that there's at least enough there. I think that statistics these days goes way, 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 way less than a two. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And makes a causal claim. Mm. So my objection is not whether or not <clears throat> we can look at data that has a much, you know, less associable, associable, associative degree than two for the hazard ratio and not consider it meaningful information. I would consider it meaningful information. I like the term hypothesis building, even though it may sound like a dismissal. It might be like, oh, it's just a hypothesis. I don't, I, I'm not going to listen to anything more you say. Okay. I think what you do is you say, you know, there seems to be a relationship here. These two variables have a correlation. And here's the strength level of it. Okay, maybe it doesn't hit a two, three, et cetera, on the hazard ratio side, but there there might be something here. It's worth looking closer. But you know, it's actually enough for me to act on myself. I may not, you know, I may not be convinced that the evidence proves causality beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's given me enough information that I can work off of that hypothesis and recognize the relative strength of what it is. And what frustrates me, Nick, is that nobody gives that answer seemingly in the nutrition space. It either is or it isn't. It's either completely dismissible and you can just throw it out in the garbage and be like, that correlation is not causation into discussion. Mm -hmm. Or no, we have enough evidence to say X causes Y. Yeah. Like red meat causes cancer. Right, that that's a if and if you look closer, by the way, they they would say actually it's it's a what is it a a car, it's oh, grade like one class a one cla yeah class one a whatever uh, it and it's actually probably causes cancer, which I feel yeah. is kind of a bit hedgy. <laughs> it, it, it's true. And yeah. then everyone runs with it. Who's yeah. pro getting rid of red meat? Goes yeah. hey red meat. It's they already said so. I forgot what the organization is, but they say they. It's quite very, uh, I think it's the who. Yeah. The who says. No one skewer me for saying that word. Yeah. <laughs> Some people get really upset about that one too. And, it, and it's like, I, I don't see any problem with saying this organization thinks X causes Y. Sure. I have a problem with. The certainty. The, yeah. The certainty. It's the confidence in the certainty. That's my main objection. Well, it goes back to my point about the arrogance, right? Right. The the idea that I mean, and that's true. That's 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 a great point. I I I agree that especially when we talk about nutrition, when you know a lot of these studies come out, that people then jump on them and then just use that and say, well, it might be a correlation study and there may be many adjustments and whatnot, but it's proving that red meat in this example is causing cancer or whatever it might be. Uh, and I think the who, I, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's the WHO that, that said that. Um, I could be a little bit off, but they probably add the word probable because, you know, just like almost any other scientist, they have to. They have to say, "Well, we can never be a thousand, you know, a hundred percent certain about anything." <laughs> so, you know, with, and, but but it does leave this this gap of okay. Well, what does probable mean? Is that a one percent uncertainty, or is that a twenty percent uncertainty? Right. And it, and a lot of this stuff is so contextless, right? Right. And you start getting to the individual level, and everything is contextless almost. Um, to the point, unless you do exactly to your point about Brad, Bradford Hill for the for the the strength of the association, unless it's just overwhelming, then the context becomes less and less of an issue uh, because it starts almost applying to everyone, no matter what. Smoking, I mean, maybe there's this rare gene that we just haven't discovered that protects you completely from smoking and cancer and whatnot. But the odds are really high that if you start smoking, 
that you're increasing your risk. We'll just say substantially. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I can absolutely see that. I think the, where epidemiologists might come in. And again, this is pure speculation on my point because I don't know, I haven't done this kind of research, but I would imagine that they have probably, would probably argue that the statistical models have moved beyond Bradford Hill and have started using greater, having greater specificity to the point where you can move that threshold down from let's say two and they do feel more confident at a little bit higher risk or whatever it might be um again pure speculation i don't know no and for what it's worth i think that's probably true i work with adrian sotomoda you got to watch his lecture yep very advanced in statistics yeah definitely and just great guy by the way and i do think that there are means by which to better ascertain the you know a higher likelihood of causality mm. the the challenge that i'm sure you're also familiar with is i i think the present i think the nature of how science is set up today is very problematic mm. 